everybody, my name is Shado. I'm a 2013 JMU grad, I'm computer science alumni, and I currently run a company by the name of Shado Labs. I'm all about innovation, family, and community, and we work with companies to build their innovative ideas on the web through websites, web apps, and that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Dave Erso, Dean of Academic Affairs at Blue Ridge Community College and the President-Elect of the James Madison University Alumni Association Board of Directors. I'm thrilled to be a part of the inaugural year of the Madison Network's Conversation Series, having dialogue about topics that matter to members of the Madison Network. What's going on everybody? My name is Chado. I am a 2013 JMU graduate of the computer science program and currently the CEO and founder of Chado Labs, a web development agency here in Harrisonburg that helps businesses and startups innovate on the web. Um, today, we're here with Madison Network, um, which is all about helping you activate your network through connection, conversation, and engagement um, with one another and JMU. Um, we're gonna talk about leadership, um, but luckily for you, you're not gonna have to listen to me for the next 30 minutes because I would botch that. With that being said, we're gonna have somebody way, way, way more spectacular. He is a good friend of mine, one of my business mentors. He is the Dean of Academic Affairs at Blue Ridge Community College. He, is, um, he has a Master's of Education, a JMU 2003 graduate, long, long time ago, I know, but he's still here and he's still with us, which is fantastic. And he is the President-Elect of the JMU Alumni Association Board of Directors. That's a mouthful. Luckily for you, we're gonna pass it off to Dave Urso. Thanks, Chato. Good morning, everyone. Thrilled to have such a great audience here. Happy to have you guys be a part of this pilot effort for the Madison Network, and I think it's going to be really spectacular to get people together to have conversations about topics that matter. As we know, it's nearly impossible to graduate from Madison and not be a leadership enthusiast, right? From our ball fields to what's happening in our science classrooms and labs, how we're changing worlds, to our 300 or 400 student organizations, which constantly push people to think differently about how they're leading, how they're interacting with their peers, and how they're changing to the community. Leadership is pretty much fused into us from the day we get here to the day we leave, which is what made it so exciting for me to be able to be someone who studies this, learns about it, challenges people to reflect on their own leadership experiences and things like that. What I've learned since graduating in 2003 uh, was that leadership is a journey that never stops though, is that you have to continue to reflect on that and continue to build from that. So I've been given the opportunity today to give you three lessons that I've learned since graduating, and I just wanna share them with you in the hopes they may help you as you pursue your own leadership opportunities, connect with people in your communities, whether you still have a little time left here, or whether you're now a full-fledged member of the Madison Network and you've been out of the school for five years, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, but you're still changing the community as only a JMU grad can be able to do. The first of those three lessons is there is nothing in life more valuable than the people you surround yourself with. Being intentional about connecting with a network that believes in you and uplifts you, but also challenges you in meaningful ways is a really powerful gift you're able to give to yourself. When we construct a network that sets us up to connect on deep levels with people, not only who are similar to us and have the same value systems, the same structure as us, but who are fundamentally different, it puts us in a better position to exceed. How are each of us intentionally giving ourselves exposure to people who are different to us and asking them to challenge us to become better individuals? I work a lot with people through mentorships. I would tell you to look at your own experiences to say, who have you challenged or asked to be a mentor in your life? Who have you said, can we establish a relationship? It may be by text, it may be by email, it may be FaceTiming. Who knows 10 years from now what the technology will be? We can maybe just close our eyes and think about the other person and we'll be able to have a conversation with them as we go. But how are we thinking about those people who are different? A lot of times we get into mentorships that aren't great. And the reason for this is we ask our buddy or someone we're close to, or someone we really admire. But this person isn't skilled at telling us maybe we're going down the wrong path, or maybe we're not making great decisions, or maybe we're not thinking something through. We need exposures who have different value sets. We need mentors who tell us, what are you doing different if you want to get to that next version of yourself? So understanding the network you surround yourself for better or for worse is absolutely the first challenge, the first task the first lesson I've seen. It's coming true in my life a lot. I've seen the network that I've built has opened doors for me, but more importantly has given me friendships and connections and relationships that I hope I'll carry with me for a long time. 
understanding and cultivating that network matters. Opportunities like today, the people who are in the discussion boards, the people who are watching these are people who have already said, I have an interest in doing that. But don't be the one who's afraid to say, I need a mentor. I love where you are in this organization. I love what you're doing professionally. Are you willing to serve in that capacity for me? It feels awkward, right? You can't walk up to somebody and say, can you do that? But if you do that, it formalizes this connection and nothing but good will follow. So I think the first message to you is really about understanding and cherishing that network. The second of the three ideas starts with a math equation. So I hope you came with your math hats on this morning or you're not watching in bed as you fade out because uh, I need you to think things through. So there are two birds sitting on a fence post and one of those birds decides to fly away. How many birds are left on the fence post? Now, this is not a trick question. There aren't half birds. No one shot a gun off in the distance that ran other people off. This is all that is in play. So there are either zero birds, one bird, or two birds left. How many people think two birds remain? How many people think one bird is left? How many people think no birds are left? Well, you got it all wrong. Okay, because one of those birds decided to fly away but didn't actually fly away. Nothing in that expression talked about actually moving forward. The second challenge, the second lesson is about moving from decision to action. Think about the concept of New Year's resolutions. How many of us say, I'm going to work out more, I'm going to eat better, I'm going to be a better friend, I'm going to read more. But then six months later, oh, six weeks later, everything's clear, the gym's freed up again. You forgot to text mom every Sunday like you said you were going to do, but that New Year's resolution is long gone. For leadership, there's a lot of implications along these same issues. We say we want to be the one who can change this. We want to bring change. We want to grow the organization. But when it comes down to actually implementing the meaningful idea that we have, we're less skilled at being able to do that. So being a leader who's able to actually move an organization from decision to action. We want to be the premier customer service provider in Virginia. All right, what do we need to do different if we're not there? What does that look like? What does that feel like? And how do we actually deliver on what it is that we're doing? So I think becoming someone who excels and moving from decision to action sets you up to better take advantage of that. The third piece of advice I'll give you, which may be one of the more significant ones and may be one of the harder ones to grapple with, is I hope that you'll become spectacular at failing. Because while we learn a lot from leadership, and while we can learn and develop based on our good days, the bad days we have and the tough days we have are what transform us as a leader. So thinking about what those are, challenging yourself to reflect, not always taking the easy path, but telling yourself, I want to try something new, I want to try something different, I want to push the envelope a little bit and get into a new space, is really what's going to be that opportunity. If you want to be a member of a community that people look to, that people say, we want you to lead this parade for us, then you have to be someone who's able to say, I've experienced the highest highs and the lowest lows, and the combination of those lessons is what's put me in my position to try to take us forward together. Each of those ideas, the concept of knowing who you're surrounded yourself with, the idea of actually moving to action once you've made a decision with things like that, and the idea of not being afraid to fail but actually embracing that failure and saying we can't do something better unless we do something different. When we talk about saying I want to be the next iteration of myself that's a better iteration of myself, then we can't continue to put the same inputs in. We have to do something different to get better results at the individual leader level or at the organizational level. So asking yourself what the inputs are and what the outputs are. Those three combined will give you a tool set that you can work with to construct the leadership opportunities you have. That's my philosophy and the three pieces of advice I want to give you as you build your own leadership career, as you develop your own leadership career further. But we'd love to know because leadership is so individual what's on your mind. So what we want to do now is open it up and have more of an informal conversation with you all about where we are as leaders now and where we hope to go next. We are back with Dave Urso, absolutely spectacular. Um, I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty darn hot, so our only defense is to be as cool as possible. <laughs> Thank you everybody for laughing, that was very, very needed. Um, but Dave had some really good points, um, points that I can all vouch for based on my experience as an entrepreneur. Um, the one, um, making sure that you, uh, you network well, that has been a huge game changer in my business growth. I remember when I started, my thought process was, um, how can I get online? How can I stay in my room as much as possible and grow my business? And after year two, three, I started realizing, wait, we're growing our business by networking and meeting people. Who you know makes all the difference. And also decision to action. There are so many people who, who make decisions but never take the action and so they don't go anywhere. Um, one of the, the reasons my business has grown is because I've taken a lot of action, sometimes the wrong actions, but 
If you don't take any actions, you're not going to go anywhere. And that kind of goes into the last point, failure, right? By taking a lot of actions, you're going to fail a lot more. Um, and Dave is completely on point that you learn the most when you do fail. That's when you reinvent yourself. That's when you really change the game. And my greatest progress, um, greatest moments of progress in my business and experience as an entrepreneur has been through, um, through failing and then kind of trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, so with that being said, um, I hope you have lots of questions. Hope you've been inspired. He's like Sonic the Hedgehog, just moving like so fast, just like giving you all this good information. Um, so um, we're going to start with three questions I have kind of ahead of time from you, the crowd, and then we're going to kind of open up the floor. Sound cool? Yeah. The first one, um, what is the biggest challenge facing leaders today? Yeah, you know, to me, I think that it, it becomes an aspect of authenticity, right? Because we talk about how divisive we are as a society right now and how we push each other away. And especially when we're in a new community or a new space, there's this idea that we try to sort of chameleon into a whole of what's comfortable so that we don't have to put ourselves out there too much. So I think it's this concept of going, do I know who I am? Do I know what my values are? Can I push myself to lead in that context that exists? And then actually become a change agent. When we discuss decision to action mm -hmm. uh, later, we coach lots of people about not becoming a raw organization, which means these are these groups that's, that are either small or huge that go ready, aim, 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 <laughs> aim, and they spend days and months and years just reconstituting and rethinking where I go instead just do something and then pick the pieces up and do something better instead. So I think when we talk about going, do I know who I am? Do I have this vision? Once I know what I value and I have this vision, now I'm more able to do that decision to action piece and actually move things forward. So I think it'd be about being authentic. So how do you, how do you balance um, you know, taking enough time to plan and making sure you have the right amount of confidence before taking that action versus just planning indefinitely and not taking action at all? Yeah, I think that that's where you have to develop that gut feel. So we've been talking mm -hmm. a lot about failure today, right? Is going, I'm challenging you to, failure, to fail often but that doesn't mean make the same mistake often. So what happens is, is we fail on a project here, but we learned we went too early, or we didn't mm -hmm. have the budget, or we didn't have a sponsor, or we <laughs> never beta tested something. So yeah. it's going next time when we fail, I don't want it to be because we didn't beta test or yeah. we didn't have the budget. So it's going, we need to do what feels right, mm -hmm. but it's this idea of not falling into analysis paralysis, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're going, I know it's time to do something, mm -hmm. but can I hide behind? I want to find two more best practices, or yeah. I want to read a little more about this, or I want to ask one more person to look at it. And then go, you know, I think in yourself that you're mm -hmm. being inauthentic and you're just dragging your feet at yeah. that point. So I think that's where it is, is going. I want you to be not making the same mistakes, mm -hmm. but also being willing to push forward and go, okay, I know in my gut it's time to push it now. I think that's fantastic. And I think you absolutely need to listen to your gut feel. Um, there are so many decisions I've made in the past where I had that gut feel and I didn't listen to it. And I look back and it was like, I knew it. Like I knew I needed to do this thing. I did that thing or I didn't do this thing and then this thing happened. So I absolutely agree. It will, it comes up so often and you think about it because what we feel, especially as, as second and third and, and growing leaders, right? The top tier of leaders, which I think JMU makes us, which I think this network of people we expose ourselves to makes us. Go Dukes. <laughs> you have that developed gut feel so you can respond in the moment. And what I see so many people struggle with is they'll go to a meeting or sit at a workshop or write something and go, this is what I'm feeling. And I'll go, then we need to tell this story. And they go, no, I can't. My boss wouldn't like it or yeah. it wouldn't go well in the church. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not anti-religious in any mm -hmm. way, but going some of the choices we make. So somebody will say, this is what I'm feeling, but I can't move on it. Mm -hmm. That's when I think we leak into that inauthentic piece of going, then is that the right community for you? Is that the right culture for you? Are you actually in position to change that organization? And you say, there are real reasons sometimes. We have bills to pay. We have young families and things like that. Mm -hmm. But being aware enough to go, this isn't my long-term answer, and sort of owning that. I love it. So you talked about um, the importance of um, getting help, uh, your network, getting mentors. Um, how do you ask for help without sounding weak or like a failure? Uh, so let me give you my, my reaction to that at yeah. the risk of it being less, if you talk to 100 CEOs, 100 of them might disagree with just it. Just rock with it. But to me, this idea of being vulnerable and just coming up and going, you do X well, mm -hmm. I'm aspiring to be better with X, can you help me? Can we get coffee once a month? Can we work together? Can I email you when I'm having struggle? I want the mentor to be not only the first person you call when something goes really well in your mm -hmm. life, 
but the first person you call when something fell apart a little bit and go, how do I rebuild this? Or how do I recover from this? Or what's my next step here? Yeah. But I think this idea of we're all our own biggest fan, right? So if you go to someone and say, boy, you are great with X. Will you help me? Without it being um, uh, uh, brown nosing, yeah. you know, but it being authentic <laughs> and just saying, I love how you do X. Will you help me? Will you coach me? That's flattering. Mm -hmm. People will say yes to that. Yeah. And then I think just owning it. But what happens then is if you don't continue to drive the bus, because I think the mentee has to drive the bus a lot in mm -hmm. those relationships, then it falls by the wayside. But if you're saying this is a relationship that I think might value me, really pursuing it aggressively has a yeah. lot of value. And I want to add to that um, in response to that question. Um, I think I want, to I want to change the question. Um, you know, the question was, how do you ask for help without sounding weak or sounding like a failure? Um, I think some of the times you're going to get the best help when you do sound weak or sound like a failure. Um, that's when people are truly able to give you um, assistance, when you acknowledge, I'm really bad at these things. Um, you know, I failed at these things. Like, I need help. Um, people can help you a million times better when you come with that frame of mind, as opposed to coming with this frame of mind, like, hey, I'm awesome at everything. Um, I don't need help with everything. Um, and you're kind of like pulling your punches. So especially with mentors, I mean, you need to be, you need to be upfront. I remember I had a conversation with Dave um, like eight months ago and we were having some company turmoil. And like, I nearly, like, I nearly cried. And like, I rarely cry. I don't think he knew that because I was like, suck it in, suck it in, suck it in. Um, but I came to him and I was like, man, like things are going terribly. Like just had like the worst like Friday ever. And like, I'm not sure what's next. And that, that's what the mentor relationship is. So I want to encourage you to feel free to feel weak, um, feel like a failure, and bring that to someone who can assist you. That's when you're really able to push the issue, I think, a little mm -hmm. bit. Because when we get to that raw part of ourselves, mm -hmm. that's sort of when you can work with it. That's the raw cookie dough, right? Once your cookies are burnt, you can't cultivate them anymore. <laughs> but when they're still in that raw phase, now we can yeah. craft them. Now we can mold them. Now we can make them what we want to be, realizing that mentors also have their strengths and weaknesses. So to me, one of the things I was trying to say earlier is have a diversity uh, within your mentors to say, this person's really great with this, but this person's great with this. We do a lot of coaching where I'll ask the person, who's the greatest leader you know? And we'll ask the room, 200 people, who's the greatest leader you know? And they'll throw people out. And then at the end, I'll say, how many people picked yourself? One hand will go up out of 200 and I'll go, we coach people to say, uh, I'm not the best leader I know. That's conceited, right? That's cocky. But I say the issue is for many of you who struggle to think about who the best leader you know is, it's because you go, mom does this really well, but not this really well. And my mm -hmm. pastor does this really well, but not this really well. But my <clears throat> boss does this really well and not this really well. If we follow that logic, then shouldn't you be the one who takes each of those bests, incorporates it into your own style of leadership, gets rid of those weaknesses, and becomes the best leader you know? That's what you ought to be aspiring to be. But get what you can from mom and from your pastor and from your boss, fuse it together, and then build off that. So good, um, good follow-up. Another question we had was, how can you lead without sounding bossy or like a know-it-all? Sometimes, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the reality is you have to be the boss. If you're in a position where you are the state boss of the organization, sometimes you have to act like mm -hmm. that and own that. In other cases, I think it's really about selling vision, mm -hmm. right? So there's an old uh, quote that says, if you want others to help you build a boat, don't ask them to collect wood. Instead, sell them on the idea of sailing in the open water. And I think leadership is really the same aspect. Can you sell me on the idea of where this project ends up. So you don't say, get wood, get wood, get wood, but say, I need you to get wood because that wood will become the base of our boat, mm -hmm. which will bring us on this journey we want to go on, the adventure we want to work down together. So I think a lot of it is about, do you A, have a vision as a leader? Yeah. Because I think too many of us work for leaders or are with leaders or know leaders who are just sort of floating in the wind. Mm -hmm. And those organizations then become more difficult because you said, I thought this was our path or I thought this was mm -hmm. our path. But instead to say, here's what my vision is, sell it to those people who are on your team. And then I don't think it feels bossy at that yeah. point because they're going, I not only understand where we're going, but I understand what my role is to help push us there. Fantastic. And to add to that, um, I think one of the best ways you can not seem like a know-it-all is to realize you don't know it all. You know, when I started my business, I thought I knew it all. I thought I could do everything the best. Um, now I realize I can do some things the best, but there are a lot of things that different employees um, who I delegate to could just do way better than I could. And so when you realize that you don't know it all and that you're going to get a better end result by truly empowering the people that are following you, um, then you're going to do a much better job at leading without sounding like a know-it-all because you don't feel like you know it all.
I like that. There's a cultural piece to that mm -hmm. that you have to spend the time as a leader to develop, though. Yep. Because a lot of times if we come and we'll say, tell me about this project you've been working on, the reaction of the team we're working with is to become defensive of, you're mm -hmm. asking about my world because I'm doing something wrong or I've let you down. If you build a culture that comes, no, my questions often come from ignorance, but I'm tasked with trying to help you, but I can't help what I don't know. Um, I think that's part of what's getting there, mm -hmm. but you have to build that with your team first. I think if Take you time. just come in and start firing questions, then people tend to put their guard up and go, boy, this, this yeah. individual just wants to tweak everything right out the gate. They don't even know who we are and what we yeah. stand for. Yeah, you've got to lead people that want to follow you. You know, if you try and lead people just because you feel like you're the boss, um, you will sound bossy all the time. You know, people have to want to follow you and it takes time to develop those relationships like you have to care. Absolutely fantastic. Please give Dave a hand. Okay. And another hand for JMU. Woo. And one final hand for Emma Maynard and the Madison Network program. Thanks for watching this video, which has been a production of the Madison Network, where we're committed to activating your network through connection, conversation, and engagement with one another and with JMU. Go Dukes!